And we're live. Good morning. Welcome to Orthodox Christian Theology. This is the host, Craig Trulia. With me today are two Anglican apologists. One is Father James, Anglican priest. Others, David Valentine, an informed um, Protestant. He's an Anglican. Um, he's educated in education, but he's just more of an informed reader of the Fathers. He's the head of the Patristics for Protestants Facebook group. Um, which shows you there are Protestants out there that care about the patristics and interact with them on a serious level. Um, today, both David and Father James are here in order to give an intelligent defense of a Protestant interpretation of Mariological scriptures um, and of Mariology in general in the early church. To try to give an account, where did veneration and um, this belief in Marian intercession come from? How about Marian doctrines like triple virginity, um, like the her alleged sinlessness, um, alleged by Orthodox, like myself. Um, also issues maybe like Immaculate Conception, Assumption. Um, we're going to give informed Protestants opportunity on this channel to present these things without being hammered in a polemical context. So that's my goal today. Um, and so what we do is going to introduce both of you guys one at a time, simply because we got audio issues and this way, we could try to keep those at a, minimum, at a minimal. I appreciate you, the audience, patience, because the content that Father James and David bring is so important that we can't be superficial go, oh, I don't like that he doesn't have a 500 microphone because he's got ideas that are better than a $500 microphone. And so I want to give both of them opportunity. So Father James, great to have you here today. Um, how did he do in Top Chef? Did you win? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for saying I have uh, ideas that are better than $500 microphones. I'm not sure that's true, but okay. <laughs> um, no, but this is actually my cassock, and I am missing my collar because I left my collar somewhere during Thanksgiving. I totally did not travel. I live in California, and we we didn't travel. All right, Gavin Newsom, governor? Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm totally telling the truth, too, yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, my collar is missing, so that's why it looks like Top Chef. Probably the hat doesn't help too, but you know when you're balding, you have to put the hat on. So, <laughs> well, you compensate with the crease facial hair. Um, David, let me give you an opportunity just to explain a little bit what you're about and plug Patristics for Protestants. Oh. <laughs> so, well, yeah, I've been. I'm learning the Fathers. I set myself a ten-year project of just reading through the Fathers. Um, a bit like a guy called David Burko, though I hadn't heard of him at the time. So I set myself 10 years, to, starting from the Apostles, getting back to Augustine. Um, I'm Anglican, but my background is um, Calvinist end of Anglicanism, evangelical in this country. And um, I'm I don't know if this makes sense or not, but I think I, I did some testing with this. Every time I unmuted my mic, it started getting clearer. And then I, I uh, for for David, so I'm going to do that. <laughs> to see if that you might unmuted. Yeah, we'll I, I, I don't. It just kept working that way, so I was like, okay, let me just undo it, and then it worked. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, so now we're on the uh, veneration of the Blessed Virgin. Correct. Correct? Sure. Roll with it. Okay. So, yeah, veneration is something that has always been, uh, since the Reformation for Anglicanism, a sort of soft spot of, of uh, contention. Um, according to our formularies, we do see problems with veneration, especially veneration and invocation of the saints as done in the West by Rome at the time. And uh, the standard was that it would not be done uh, within Anglicanism. We've moved away from that gradually. And we've become much more friendly with iconography. I mean, I have an icon right there of my favorite saint, uh, Athanasius, right there of Alexandria. And uh, even with like the most many of the most reformed Anglicans, at least within uh, the United States, uh, they are fine with iconography. And in fact, Calvin himself was actually not inherently opposed to iconography. He was opposed to its abuses. Uh, so it was more of a matter of prudence than it was a matter of uh, like sort of a second commandment violation inherently because of iconography. So I would latch on to much of the seventh ecumenical council. Um, there are some things that I would have to discuss and debate about within that. Uh, but 
I'm fine with iconography, and, uh, and most Anglicans today are. Uh, the question of uh, invocation is a different issue, and I go back and forth on this. Uh, I do see the problems with uh, many uh, on the more reform side about invocation of the saints. I have done it myself, uh, invocation of the saints, including the Blessed Virgin. I have a rosary. Um, but I've moved more, slightly more reformed in the past year or so. Uh, my position on invocation of the saints is that for my own personal prayer life, what I do is any invocation of the saints is directed first to God, asking God to ask the saints to pray for me, if that makes sense. Um, that is a, I don't want to call it a compromise. I think that there is nothing unorthodox about that, little O, big O. And I think it's something that I feel more comfortable and safe doing uh, out of any sort of fears uh, of, of overstepping the boundaries concerning prayer. And just so Orthodox are aware, one of our most frequent prayers is through the prayers of the Theotokos, the Savior, save us. <laughs> right? So it's the same thing, right? You're asking God through her prayers to save you. Well, yeah. Right, Father but, James, that's what you're, you're talking about. Well, kind of, but you're referencing uh, the Blessed Virgin in that prayer. We would actually do it the opposite way. We would say, uh, uh, oh, God, our Heavenly Father, we ask that you uh, ask the Blessed Virgin to pray for us for our salvation. Well, that's uh, the same thing. I just started a little different, right? Through the prayers, well, you start, to well, Savior. But, yeah, well, the Address question, to God. Uh, wait, say it again then? Through the prayers of the Because it's through the prayers of the Theotokos, oh, Savior. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, okay. Yeah, then yeah. Uh, but <laughs> but you would be fine with praying directly to the Theotokos, though. Of course, yeah. Yeah, so that would be then the difference, yeah. The, uh, so, and it's a real shame. Maybe we, we finally found the way to make David's microphone work. So we're going to give it a shot next time because David was getting at something. I'm going to try to purposely make David's case a little bit because he's got a lot of great information. And if the microphone thing now works, I might have to like cut out the first 20 minutes of the show or something. So that way people, the finished product is easier for people to follow. But that is this. There are scholars like Dr. Schumacher, um, Dr. Barker, that essentially believe that what we consider Mariological doctrines to be invasions from Gnosticism and really before that paganism into Christianity. Now, we want to be careful saying this because what the scholars are not are like just fundy Baptists, right? They're, they're all very liberal Christians. Um, so they're not making like a fundamentalist Baptist argument with, with no basis in actual history whatsoever. Not a trick track. Right. You know, so the issue would be like, for example, one of the sources for early Mariological doctrines is Ascension of Isaiah. Ascension of Isaiah very clearly is Gnostic, right? It, it reduces Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, to be uh, these angelic beings. Um, it has, um, it actually has aerial toll houses, by the way. It has varying levels of illumination, stuff that you'll find in St. Dionysius, Africa. It's a very complicated document, one that may, if, I should do a show on, but I don't think anyone really cares enough for me to actually present the Ascension Isaiah. But the point would be is here's a document which is clearly not orthodox in the small o sense by anyone's standard, but it's actually our earliest document with Marian doctrines. Um, we are aware of deities which are essentially consorts of God um, that would have been familiar to pagans. And so if there was syncretism, there's a possibility that they would then alter their female deity into Theotokos. Now, this sounds crazy, but I've seen it firsthand in my wife's country. You know, they're Buddhists, but they're really syncretists. They have a whole, you know, pl pleroma of, of angels and stuff like that. And they pray to the moon. And, and so, yet, so it's not properly Buddhism that they call themselves Buddhists. So this is not something that doesn't exist. We have no interaction with. Um, my question then, that being said, being that there's scholars that are aware of this, I want to pose this, pose this to David, and we're going to try with mute, microphones not muted to see if this helps David. Um, the question being, how do you think that made the jump? Make the defense that, yes, this is something that was carried over from Gnosticism or from paganism into Gnosticism to Christianity. Make that case to the audience that this is what actually occurred. I'm not sure that it, I'm not claiming that occurred. Um, I think that the um, 
Gnosticism was successfully resisted before the Marian thing took off. So I'm not saying it's necessarily Gnostic. I think it's better than that. Um, first of all, uh, how's the sound, by the way? Okay. <laughs> okay. No, I think the Marian thing appears. I believe, you know, most of the Marian doctrines are an error. And I think the, you know, the, an error that the church needs to turn back from um, for its own unity. But um, yeah, ecumenical in my outlook, I want the church reunified. You know, I, I'm, I've been passionate about Rome's reunification with orthodoxy and Protestantism with Rome for a long time. Um, I take, you know, I want to get out of the trenches we've been in for centuries. So, but I think, you know, they have to, we all have to know where we stand in terms of what we're prepared to compromise on. Um, and I'm, uh, regarding Rome, I'm very positive about the, pos sorry, I'm jumping away from your question, but <laughs> I'll go back. But I'm very optimistic given Vatican II and all the progress that was made there on this issue. You know, I've got lots to say about Vatican II and Mariology. Um, because, as I said at the start, you know, I know a lot more about Rome than Orthodoxy. Um, and I know that in Orthodoxy, the, it's not teaching that's central, it's practice that's the central Marian thing, is it not? That uh, in Orthodoxy, you're not that bothered about defining everything. Um, when it comes to Mary, it's all about what we do. Yeah. So where I think it comes from, well, okay, I would say John was given Mary yeah, at the cross. So John is the apostle who looks after mary and he's uh, my reading of the new testament is that john was given charge of mary and it it was partly because christ wanted to slow john down he was the son of thunder he was a you know um a loose cannon you can have these back now oh, you've got them. um and mary's uh, rosie's got them upstairs sorry um and uh, John was given Mary as a sort of discipline to, to slow him down and get him to sit still. While the other apostles were all out missioning from 43 onwards um, and doing what Paul was doing. We just know more about Paul. Um, there was John stuck until presumably Mary's death because suddenly John moves, doesn't he? He moves to Ephesus from southern Palestine. And, um, and John is there for the rest of his ministry based in Asia. So um, the, my understanding is if you look at the patristic tradition and its relationship to John, and this I'm going somewhere with this, um, that the, the, John's relationship with Mary is reflected in his gospel. So the gospel of John is one of our main sources for Mary, uh, that and Luke. And, um, so, and um, that orthodoxy retains that memory, that's how I understand it, the, the huge shadow of the Gospel of John, of John's ministry, of the Apostle John and his tradition is, is, the, is the huge sort of influence on orthodoxy. If you go to as far as Gregory, um, the theologian, Gregory Nazianzen in the fourth century, um, you know, John is the theologian, yeah? And then to, apart from Gregory in orthodoxy, there's only two guys called the theologian, and it's John and Gregory. So, um, the, the idea of that, I think, John, if you want to look at apostolic schemes behind the branches of Christendom, yeah, that Rome is obsessed with Peter, but it used to also have a big thing for Paul. Now, Paul tends to belong to the Protestants, speaking very simplistically. But it seems to me that, with along with Andrew, um, John is very central, and everything coming from John is very central to orthodoxy. So I think, and, and my reading of Polycarp and Irenaeus and the tradition behind the canon of the New Testament is that again, that's essentially the school of John um, from my studies in the second century. So I would suggest that um, this, a sense of profound loyalty to Mary, a sense of a sort of ancestral memory of the deep relationship with Mary that John brought into his branch of Christendom. Um, I think we shouldn't underestimate the, the stature, the shadow of the apostle. And I think orthodoxy retains that sense of loyalty to Mary. So I don't think it's, I think it's a lot better than simply a survival from Gnosticism or a collapse into paganism. I don't, I think I was persuaded by, again, Gambero, the Catholic scholar, his arg argument that perhaps it was God's providence that Mary only reached a more prominent role later um, in the apostolic tradition in order to protect the Marian devotion from being. Now, let me, let me, let me. Um, which would be this, and, and you can answer too, Father James, but this is really more a follow-up with David, which would be this. If the theory we're going to be working under is that the shadow of the Apostle John um, 
and his closeness to the Theotokos is something that manifests itself with uh, with increasingly magnified veneration and memory of Mary until it became full blown, as you probably call it, Mariolatry. Um, my question for you is: Let's let's delineate this in the second century, dealing with the documents that we have: Ascension of Isaiah, uh, Proto Evangelicum of James, Ode to Solomon. Would you consider these doctor these documents from rising from the lady? And if so, where, why, why did that shadow cast itself with the lady and not with the teachers of the church? Any of any real authority? Well, I'm saying, in, as a matter of fact, the you know none of the fathers that are in the mainstream of Orthodox Christian doctrine say those things. So that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying. Well, they I agree with you, but, but why do you think? That is, though, why the difference between lady and uh, the, the well, teacher? it's one explanation of the you know, the, the the as I say, the sort of indifference to Mary among the fathers, um, for the first three centuries from the apostles. We've got well, most of the apostles are dying in you know, in the time of roughly the time of Peter and Paul die in the 60s, and then for a good 300 years, nobody is talking about Mary beyond the parameters the apostles set. Suddenly, something new emerges. The explanation of that is complicated. Um, as I hinted earlier, I think the, the sudden emergence in the between, let's say, 360 and, and 420, that sudden emergence of Mariology, um, it seems to be socially led that they, they basically more and more people were choosing the monastic life, um, and women were going for the, the you know the, the life of monasticism as nuns, and that that was that whole movement, which I don't disapprove of and don't think was a bad thing. I think God worked through it. It was a very powerful lever on civil, on the Christian the Christianization of civilization. So I'm not anti-monastic, but I think the growth of monasticism, people were looking for models. They were looking for an ideology to justify that new ethic. Um, and they just went too far. And I think, you know, this the perpetual virginity of Mary went from being a fair debate, because I don't deny that it's a possible gloss on the New Testament. You can read the New Testament through what I call the Catholic model, which is that, you know, these Mary did was perpetually virgin. These were not his brothers. But it's not the natural reading of Scripture. You know, it's just not there. You'd, you'd only project it onto Scripture if you had another reason to project it onto Scripture. And it seems to me that projection was socially led, that Christians were looking for a, a justification. I think Ambrose was promoted too quickly, rather like Cyprian, because he was of a high social status. He was from, you know, a very patrician family. So I think... Um, but Cyprian had different effects, but with Ambrose, I think he was a little bit out of his depth, and I think he was, you know, um, he didn't know his stuff. Um, it was difficult for guys working in the Latin West. It was even difficult for Augustine not to have access to the Greek um, fathers, not to have access to the full Orthodox tradition. Um, and, author and as Augustine, as Orthodox theologians in the last 50 years have begun to increasingly recognize, Augustine is outside the Orthodox tradition, as the Arminians have always maintained in within Protestantism. So um, there was a straying in the West um, from orthodoxy, but the, the practice that what happened in Constantinople, the, the whole issue of uh, the Council of Ephesus between Nestorius and Cyril, um, is it Cyril of Alexandria? Um, these, that, that's, uh, that's, I mean, Cyril of Alexandria's teaching on Mary is clearly not orthodox. He's, he's gone miles from the apostolic parameters and he's teaching things that were not taught by anyone in the previous 300 years. So um, well, let me pose the question to both of you then, which would be um, uh, where did the popular support come from, right? Um, if this is something that trickled its way up uh, with bishops that maybe were prematurely uh, elevated uh, as you're positing like uh, Ambrose, um, there ha where did the pressure to f on them come from? How where did that originate from the lady? Uh, so for me, <clears throat> obviously, I'm much friendlier to the Marian dogmas. Not all of them, obviously. Uh, you and I would disagree or, or agree on uh, our disagreement with the Immaculate Conception, for instance. Uh, but for me, uh, it goes back to that whole thing. I, I'm I'm fine with sticking with what the church. I I I feel like I am safer with what the consensus of the church says. So it's not a salvation issue for me, and I would never wish for it to be a salvation issue, which is why I believe in the assumption of the Blessed Virgin, but I do not appreciate Rome's position, which is it is dogma. So you you reject it to the um, uh, 
uh, risk of your damnation. Um, but I'm fine with it as pious belief. Okay, so you you actually think your gut would be Father James that um, there wasn't this difference between the lady and the uh, clergy on most of these issues. You just don't think it should be dogmatically binding. Now, yeah. for for David, I'll just just if you could clarify for us, being that you say it made this jump uh, from the uh, lady into the clergy. My question for you is, how did it originate in the laity? The, the how, if you can answer how. So why was the laity pushing for the Marian? Well, where did they get it from, and then why did they push? Hmm. Um, well, why did that woman in the, on the street in Luke's Gospel suddenly cry out to Christ, blessed is the mother who bore you? I think any woman looking at Christ would have that thought, yeah? The, the, it was a natural thought to have. And can you hear me all right? It's a terrible sound. Um, so I think the same thing, you know, this guy's great, so who is his mother? <laughs> so <laughs> I, don't, I, I, I'm, I would be wary of making this allegation that, that what I would call more extreme Protestants make, um, of just saying this is all Gnostic, this is all pagan. Um, but the I would say that, as I get, again, from Catholic sources, that if the laity were under the huge pressure of the goddess cults in the Roman Empire, which we forget about, and we, you know, we're, unless you're a classical scholar, you forget how important these things were. Um, the pastoral life of the, of the early church was massively shaped by people coming from that background. Among the church fathers, we're, they're shaped by their Platonic education, by the classical schools behind um, the education of the literate classes in the Roman Empire, who are obviously a minority. But among the popular people, um, you know, most Christians who tended to be the humbler parts of society, there was, you know, an expectation that something divine and feminine must be up there. Um, and Mary's the obvious candidate. And it, I assume that that's why the New Testament has this policy of what I would call extreme discretion. Um, and it is arguable um, that you know, once the pagan, once Roman paganism began to decline, it freed Christians to be more interested in Mary. I would take that quite liberal view. Um, so, uh, one someone, someone I would celebrate, for example, is Ephraim the Syrian, writing in the mid fourth century. Um, his poetry is, it seems to me, a completely legitimate expression of Christian imagination. He's imagining what it was like for Mary. He's imagining what it was like to grow up as the son of God. He's imagining, he's writing, he's, he's engaged in historical fiction through his poetry. It seems to me that's perfectly legitimate. There's nothing wrong with that. And the problem with um, a lot of what went wrong, especially among in the Latin culture, in the Roman Catholic Church, what's gone wrong is that a confusion of the imaginative engagement with doctrine. So in the Catholic Church, there's been this massive flipping over from let's imagine Imagine what it was like to be Mary. Let's imagine Christian art, which is perfectly legitimate. Yeah, the, the endless pietas, the endless um, Madonna and child iconography, perfectly fine there in the New Testament. But to make that jump from fact, from fiction to fact, from imagination to intellect, you know, to take it seriously as a piece of doctrine, that seems to be the big mistake that's happened in Rome. Um, but it was it was always uh, in, in. I'm used to the Roman interface, remember and. Before 1850, things weren't as bad. It was there was a really dark century from 1850 to 1950, with Pius IX to Pius XII, um, where the Catholic Church created these two doctrines of the well, the, the infallibility of the Pope is obviously extremely divisive for orthodoxy, um, but also the um, Immaculate Conception at one end of that century in 1854, and the Assumption in 1950 extremely unhelpful doctrines. Even a lot of Orthodox, I understand from Catholic friends, were upset by the proclamation of the Immaculate Conception and some by the proclamation of the Assumption because the Orthodox world saw it as rather improper to be giving doc legal doctrinal definition to these practices of the church. And I'm, in I'm intrigued at the possibility that Orthodoxy perhaps hasn't made that Roman mistake in the sense that in orthodoxy, there hasn't been this attempt to massively define and intellectualize Marian devotion, that Marian devotion has remained um, an, an exercise of the imagination. 
Um, it's something that non-Orthodox, non-Catholic Christians around the world, even friends of mine who become Catholics, they can't relate to the Marian thing. Even John Henry Newman, you know, famous convert in my country's history, he said he couldn't relate to the Marian devotion. It just meant nothing to him. You have to grow up in a culture like Italy or Greece where that makes sense um, or an Orthodox home. For, for most of us, the Marian devotion makes no sense at all. But talking to Catholic and Orthodox people, particularly women, I have to say, has helped me to understand how it feels to be praying through Mary to Christ. Yeah? And um, I'm not someone who says all Catholics and Orthodox are worshipping Mary. I can see the distinction. Um, but um, but the, the definition within Catholicism has been destructive and divisive and unhelpful. And I think Rome is going to have to, if the church is ever going to be unified, Rome's going to have to go back on that. But, um, but they're, they're on the way because, because Rome has turned towards the sources. You know, a wonderful thing that happened in the last hundred years before and after Vatican II is that Rome has turned back towards the sources. The resourceful movement was huge um, behind Vatican II. So if Rome is saying, OK, you know what, let's forget the last thousand years of Latin you know, schismatic Roman doctrine, as Orthodox would call it. Let's just look back at the fathers. Well, if Catholics start looking at the fathers, if Protestants start looking at the fathers, and if the Orthodox are taking an honest look at the fathers, we will, you know, that we're coming, if we're starting from the same sources of authority, we're going to come to some sort of unity. We'll be able to reach a place of peace. Now, let me ask this, and we can give Father James a qu answer first, and then um, uh, we could get David's. And forgive me for being punchy, but you know we're trying to make this somewhat fun because it's a show. You know, why not venerate the Theotokos? Why not pray to her and she can intercede before God for you, right? Why not? She wants to look at her. <laughs> you know, so why not? Well, you know my answer. Uh, <laughs> My answer is I'm fine with the uh, veneration and the uh, invocation. Uh, I'm fine with it specifically in the context of, of uh, referencing God, asking that she pray for us. Uh, so, yeah, I'm with you on that. I mean, I, uh, your, your listeners probably don't, may or may not know, but I came to Anglicanism uh, through Eastern Orthodoxy. I first discovered liturgy through the Eastern Orthodox, and I almost became Eastern Orthodox, but there were some issues that I had theologically so I ended up becoming Anglican instead. But why not ask her for prayer? Ask her. <laughs> well, the question well, is, can she? Can she? Well, uh, so why why can I not ask God? Well, why not ask other people too? <laughs> I, I, I want well, to let's play start biblically. I still have a bit of Protestantism in me, uh, so I, I want to play it safe. Where I I would rather ask God to ask those things of of his own saints so and, and biblically speaking then what would be the precedent for that well there well there is no precedent for uh well at least no explicit pre precedent I've, I've seen some arguments uh for uh prayers for those who are in the church triumphant um i i wouldn't say it's praying for the dead because that would be a rejection of the resurrection but although the the resurrection hasn't happened for them yet uh so they are not fully dead but there, there is a deadness of their body. Um, so there is the obviously the Old Testament uh, uh, warning against prayers for the dead, or to the dead, I should say, not for the dead. Uh, within Anglicanism, we actually do pray for the dead. Within the 1928 prayer book, we have prayers explicitly for the dead. Um, but uh, my, my point being that, yeah, I, I always want to make sure that uh, I, I see no problem, and I, I see it safer to ask God to do the requests uh, rather than uh, risk committing some sort of sin by by that communication between those in the church and those uh, here. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would throw in something about angelology here, that in the New Testament, uh, um, Paul talks about those who worship, worship angels, yeah? So I think the, it, one is not saying that there's no mediation, that when we talk to God, there may well be beings in the way. But um, what I think the scriptures consistently do is say, don't focus, don't, don't imagine that you can see this as a cross section from sideways on, that you can talk, you don't think about what's between you and God. It's like saying, look through the window, but don't worry about the glass, you know? And um, it may well be that many of our prayers are heard by intermediary beings. Um, 
And, you know, there's, there's a richness to the imagination in the Anglican, Catholic, Orthodox, and many branches of Orthodox tradition, and the idea of mediation between us and God in the sense that there's an economy of heaven. But the scriptures are very clear about, I'd use that word discretion again, that this is not revealed. So we are not set, we're not free to investigate these things because they're just not, we're just not told. Presumably, we're not, in a, we're not supposed to know. God, wasn't, God knows that we are in a position of tutelage. Um, in this age, and we, unless we are, yeah, what I mean, it, it's a default position of paganism to worship angels in some form, to worship heavenly beings. You know, most African traditional religion, many African tribes, you know, 100 years ago, there was still the idea of, a, of an ultimate God, a creator above everything, as there is in Hinduism. But in between, it's like the clouds between us and the sun, there's all the intermediaries. And it seems to me that the scriptures want us to avoid any thought of the intermediaries that direct access to god is it's an exaggerated concept in protestantism that is that kills a lot of christian imagination um i would say that but um the idea of us having direct access to god is apostolic it's very clear in the apostolic tradition so um it's just i can't relate to praying through mary i i can't imagine that when i if i try to talk to mary that she can hear me so if i'm working in a catholic school or if i'm at a Catholic service, and there's a prayer to Mary. I just can't relate to that at all. I'm, I don't judge those who do, but I would say, you know, I, I can't imagine. It. I think she's asleep in Christ, and she can't hear me, and that's full stop. And and it seems to me that the New Testament. My, I keep going back to this. The New Testament, the first three centuries of the Fathers. The same thing. No one is interested in Mary. No one is talking to Mary or even about Mary. You know, Mary is not important. That I, I'm not making that up and I'm not trying to impose that. I'm just saying that's there in the tradition. So where does this come from? We've been discussing various theories of where it came from. But I would just say if we want to be Orthodox Christians in this, with a small O or a big O, if we want to be rooted in the scriptures and the fathers, then where on earth does this come from? <laughs> you know, where what on earth is making people want to talk to Mary rather than straight to Christ? Father James? Yeah, so I do want to point out, I, I would have a disagreement there. I do believe that the saints in heaven are actually praying for us. I think we see evidence for this in Revelation itself. So I am fully convinced that the saints in heaven are praying for us, including the Blessed Virgin. Um, I just do not believe that I have necessarily direct access to the Blessed Virgin through prayers. And I would rather, I, I mean, honestly, if I had a choice between people here praying for me and the saints in heaven praying for me. I mean, I love you guys, but I'd rather have the saints in heaven praying for me. But I see that the avenue through that is uh, through uh, God himself. Uh, I, I think that, I think my avenue of prayer should be always be directly through Christ, always. Uh, so uh, there's a um, Lutheran pastor and uh, he, he does YouTube stuff. His name's uh, Jordan Cooper. He, he actually brought up a great point that I think is uh, important. and. Uh, like his solo scripture is a bit stronger than mine is, but he points out that we never see prayer in scripture that is not in the context of worship. So I, I would agree with that. And so that, that's, that's one of the hesitations I have with the idea of prayers to the saints uh, directly to them rather than prayers to God asking them to pray for us. I like your point, James, that um, there's a distinction between believing that the saints are praying for us and and what what what, I, what that means for us in terms of what we we should do, um, we can believe that we're being prayed for, but we're not encouraged to pray too. Um, it's just Paul is constantly talking about sleep uh, saints who are, have gone to sleep in Christ, and there's never any suggestion we communicate with them. Um, I would just say, you know, I do bring a Protestant mind to this because I spent thirty years immersed in Scripture without any touch with the fathers, and then when I discovered the fathers, I found they agreed with Scripture that. You know, they're, they're, so I'm kind of innocent of church tradition in that respect that, you know, I would just say, why would you want to do this? Where in the New Testament and is there any suggestion that we pray to anyone but the Trinity? If, if, if I could add uh, my thoughts to that, I think there is a, a problem, and I, I mean no disrespect, but um, I think there's a problem with the mindset that uh, I'm being, I'm not being influenced by the history of the church, therefore I have like a pure doctrine, which you're not explicitly saying that, but it, it can come across that way we all come to any text with biases. And I i mean, that's what I grew up as a Baptist with, is like, oh no, we just look to the Bible alone. And actually I'm 
writing a book right now where in part of uh, a chapter, I'm dealing with this issue where this idea that we can just come to the text with quote, no biases, and that's just not possible. So if I'm going to have biases, I want to have the biases of the consensus of the church, so. Now, let me yeah. ask, ask, and uh, and David's gonna have to go to mute, which would be, we have arguably four prayers to the Theotokos that precede um, Nicaea. Right, they give us some sort of delineator here, and to name them, we it would be the subtum presidum. Um, there's some debate over dating, and you know, you and Father James and David, you could talk about this, but we have that prayer for those who are listening that's oh, Mother God, do not despise our petitions in time of trouble, but rescue us from dangers, only pure, only blessed one. Um, there's the anaphoras of Coptic slash Egyptian basil. Um, and it mentions during its litany, the Holy and Glorious Mary Theotokos, and by her prayers have mercy on us all. Um, we have a short prayer in the Gospel of Bartholomew, and we have a um, prayer um, that we found archaeologically in a grotto in Jerusalem. And so I bring these up because to David's credit or to his point, is like these are not like saints teaching pray to Mary, right? These are all examples of prayers that have been preserved by unearthed manuscripts um, or a grotto in our graffiti, right? So we don't know, uh, probably was not a bishop writing the graffiti, right? So, you know, these are where we have these indications. Um, but I guess my question would be, why, why is that important? Because do we have indication of any prayers to anyone being preserved by the teachers of the church. So that'd be my question for you. Should we expect that prayers and veneration practices would be recorded and thereby uh, found in the sort of works that we have from the fathers? Is this for James or for me? Um, both you could answer, um, but you're already talking, so you start. You're already talking, so you start. Ooh, okay, thanks. Um, well, I would just say my key question for an Orthodox on this is, OK, if these reflect the Orthodox line of the church, if this is the line of apostolic Christianity, if this is apostolic tradition, why do none of the doctrinal writings, the apologetic writings, the exegetical writings of the fathers for 300 years, why do they never mention this? Why is there never any talk of praying to saints, praying to Mary? Why is it never referenced when they do write about prayer? They do write about the Trinity. They do write ecclesiology. It's, all, you know, all the right things are there. And yet, no, there is no witness to this in what you would, would recognize as Orthodox Christian tradition. So why is it that something that which is clearly marginal, that is clearly not part of the apostolic deposit in the mainstream documents of patristics? I, I take your point, by the way, Father James, that of course there's no such thing as unbiased um, and or coming to the text naked. I'm just saying that I spent years listening to sermons and being immersed in scripture and no one ever, it never came up that, you know, um, and, uh, and I would, I, it's not that, I, I think a lot of Protestants have a very weak ecclesiology, and that's the problem with sort of scriptura, is that it's, it's just incoherent and Catholics can make hay with it. Um, you have to accept that you're, you're part of a tradition, and the Orthodox and Anglican emphasis on tradition and the church, as the, author, as the, the church comes before the doctrine, I absolutely agree. But um, what I'm saying is, okay, well, let's look at the early church. What's left from the early church? Does it teach any of this? Does it ever refer to it? So who cares where these prayers come from? Who wrote, or who wrote these prayers? If we've got nothing, I would just constantly emphasize that there's got two tracks here. We've got a few scraps of liturgy and prayer, and I don't want to just denigrate them and say they have no value, but I'm just saying they seem to have absolutely no connection with all the documents that have given us the apostolic tradition of the church. So if there's no connection, well, then let's just ignore them. Um, but I, yeah, I am coming to it from a Protestant mentality. I'm just baffled that the Orthodox folk can say this is apostolic tradition when, okay, well, I say, well, show me in the fathers, show me in the fathers, show me in the fathers. These people were leading the church. Why did they not say this? Why is there no evidence they were practicing it? Father James? Um, yeah, I, there's not much I can say to that. I, I mean, I would like to hear what your thoughts are considering his, I guess, friendly challenge. 
Okay. Uh, <laughs> point this isn't for me to to attack your vantage points, but no, no, no. I'll I'll try I, to gently push that. back a little bit. Yeah. How's that? Yeah. Um, well, for example, some of these sources would have more weight than other sources when we look at these. So, for example, the subtum presidum, um, most of these are one found in Egypt because of just sand will preserve paper better. So, right, some of that is just part of archaeology. Um, but the that prayer, it's hard to know. Um, okay, well, is this indicative of something that was approved at higher levels or not? Um, I think there's some indication that there was because the prayer is preserved in Orthodox prayers. So it's just we found an early document of it. So maybe, all right, the key word would be if we're, we look at this in an even-handed way. The Gospel of Bartholomew would be a pretty low-quality source if we're going to argue it, it adds weight behind um, uh, Mariology being something in the early church. Um, that being one, it's only found in the Vienna manuscripts. So that means there's differences in the manuscripts. So even if we have certain scholars like Dr. Schumacher, which would say, no, this is second century evidence of the practice, um, that's his opinion. I mean, all we have is a manuscript, I presume from Vienna, because it's called the Vienna manuscript, that attests to it. It's not like we unearthed it and we could positively date the piece of paper from the second century or something like that. That's People don't know this oftentimes, uh, but like that's not how history works. It's very rare you actually get a document where the document itself is that old. Right, we're usually dealing with manuscripts that are much newer than that, so that's worth saying. Um, Except that the New Testament is the exception, so we have the New Testament as better attested than anything. Well, and yes, and again, I'm not Bart Ehrman, but like so, but even then, we're really dealing with really third and mostly fourth century, where we start getting very large documents that are relatively complete, which will preserve for us the early scriptures. But you know. That's a whole other episode, and we could always do that someday. I mean, that's something I find extremely interesting. Um, but that aside, what would be, I would say, compelling evidence of approval of the fathers of Marian intercession would be the liturgical evidence, because the liturgies would have been, if they're written down, right, would have been what was approved and what was purposely propagated. Because we do know that early liturgies weren't all written down. And people all had their own local traditions. And it's only over time they started writing down and, and standardizing um, these different liturgies, even though they all were very highly similar. Um, but that being said, it's if we have a fourth century prayer to Mary in a liturgy, chances are St. Athanasius was doing that same liturgy. And that, that would be, I think, a stronger material evidence. Um even if it's not Athanasius writing about it in apologetic work, because without there being a, co a specific controversy like Jerome for him to respond to, it's not going to come up. And this, and the top of my head, right. I know there's, they talk about prayer, but you know, what treatises before Nicaea are written just on prayer, right? It's, it's this less of it. My, my last point would be this. And then I, cause again, it's not about me, but it's because there's a good visual element to this. I was talking off the air with Father James about this. Which one of these, I'm going to hold up two books, if it got dropped in Egyptian desert and covered by sand, is more likely to be preserved for posterity? This, all right, here's my Bible, right? There's some rabbit ears in it. It's obviously used, you know, even my, you can tell my son's been through it and messed up a few pages, all right? Um, or my prayer book. <laughs> which one of these is more, more likely. And it's not that I, I, I read this every single day. So it's not, this doesn't get read. <laughs> That's not the point. Um, the, the difference would be that one by, let's say, imagine early church in the Bible, it's used actually in the liturgy. They would have their own Bible, their own library of scriptures there. Um, they may be of higher quality um, because they've been not for personal use, but for communal use. Also, you're not going through short sections of it over and over and over, right? You're, it's a lectionary. You're going through pieces of it. Compared to this, I'm doing the morning prayers every single day, right, out of this. And I'm not even – this looks terrible. I'm not even really reading this thing every day, right, because I've got parts memorized. Um, so if you got prayers memorized and not even written down or when they are written down they're for personal use, it makes it less likely that document could survive. So we might be trying to look for stuff, which we can know from even modern evidence would be less likely given how it's used could survive. 
Um, so again, that doesn't prove it. I'm not pretending it does, but that may address at least some of your objections. Like if you could point to me a specific um, controversy, which would have been injected into itself, intercession, the saints or, or, or prayers, which then would have gave the opportunity for this to be fleshed out. I would say that sort of historical interpretation would make more sense. Um, now, again, these are all interp these are all competing interpretations. That's why I brought you guys on, right? When we're dealing with absences of evidence or evidence like I have a liturgy, right? That doesn't mean Athanasius approved it, right? These are all just yeah. interpretations we give. And so what I'm just offering here is an alternate interpretation. Let me give the floor to you to respond, and then we can move on maybe to the Immaculate Conception. Okay. So uh, quickly, I, I do want to make a, a slight critique there. I, I would say that... Uh, yes, we have liturgies in the fourth century uh, with with these invocations. However, I wouldn't say that because we have evidence of them there in the fourth century necessarily that, or, or even likely that St. Athanasius was using it. I would say that if we do have evidence for it, um, I would say that there is a, 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 seems to be a good indication that it's not seen as a problem, not necessarily that they are using it. I think that if there was a problem with it, then there they, we would see a, a um, maybe not necessarily an uproar, but some sort of contention, some sort of fight against it happening. I mean, we see that with Nestorius, with uh, with Mother of God versus Mother of, of Christ, you know, Christotokos versus Theotokos. David. So, what's your specific question here? Oh, this your oh, comment. <laughs> Well, I, I was going to say that um, your point about the surviving documents, it is a little bit messy before Nicaea, not as messy as that, but um, we've got a lot from Tertullian, for example, um, and Tertullian is not just indifferent to the Catholic or Orthodox agenda on Mary, but actually consciously resisting it, and openly so, and says quite offensive things from a Catholic point of view. Um, but when we get to the fourth century, when the Catholic Christianity is born, when we have an imperial faith, when we have huge surviving corpuses like Christostom's or Nazianzen or especially St. Augustine, we've got an enormous witness from working bishops to the life of the church. Yeah? And yet the, the case, like when I went through two different Catholic books trying to talk, make a case for um, Mariology in the early church, you know, just in this one, his chapter on St. Augustine, you know, probably our largest surviving corpus, I think, um, and very comprehensive, working bishop in North Africa. Um, and, you know, the, the case is hopeless. And Augustine still, 300 years after Christ's ministry, Augustine at his death is still not writing about Mary in any way that, that I, as a, you know, for anyone from Protestant background wouldn't be working with. Um, Augustine's not saying the right things. And yet when Augustine dies, we have the Council of Ephesus and suddenly someone is saying that. So it's coming from a different place. But I would just say, you have a point about your prayer book versus your Bible, um, which would survive for an archeologist. I'm just saying, well, once we do have enormous surviving corpuses, we still have fathers that are central to the tradition of the church, still completely continuing what I would call the apostolic tradition. Now, if you can unpack a little bit, because we were asked this, and you just got on the topic, and we will have a question answers uh, for everyone. Um, but you said something about Saint Cyril. Um, your question for you would be: What does what do you think that Saint Cyril, Cyril of Alexandria taught about Mary that was new or wrong? If you don't mind giving us the context of the situation, David's on mute. <laughs> Um, well, uh, oh gosh, what can I say? That's a big one. I mean, Theotokos was coined by Athanasius. I don't think it's so coined by Origen, though there is debate. But um, Athanasius is using Theotokos to, 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 to organize his Christology. He coins the term for Christological purposes. But by the time we get 50 years later, more than 50 years later, to um, Cyril, um, Theotokos is being used to exalt Mary, not to exalt Christ. I think the, the term it changed in its usage. So I find Catholics using Theotokos, that it's effectively using Christ as a leg up to, to increase the status of Mary. But that's, that's precisely the opposite of why it was coined by 
Athanasius. So on Theotokos itself, I think it's being misused. So Nestorius's objection to Theotokos was to that um, misuse of the term. And his emphasis on Chris, on on Christotokos was he was just trying to say you're, it's being misused. And, um, you know, the, the, the um, agenda of the church at, at Constantinople under Cyril and his friends was a long way from apostolic tradition and the story of objection was perfectly justified. I am a little bit out of my depth when I get to Ephesus because I only know it's an outline. I know, as I said, I've only got as far as the around 200 in my detailed read through. So on Marian stuff, I've got that far. But so when you ask me what was wrong with Cyril, well, I also say even Catholic and even, well, I haven't read any Orthodox apologists accounts of um, the Council of Ephesus, but even the Catholics fully admit that Cyril behaved extremely badly at Ephesus. You know, he, he basically took over the council, proclaimed the excommunicated stories before he even gets there. You know, it, it was his behavior was appalling. And even Catholic apologists admit that, but they forgive Cyril because he says the right thing from subsequent points of view. But I would, what the funny thing for me is that the, the, it's not what they taught, it was the character of the people promoting the, the novel Marian doctrines. Um, if you look at Jerome, Jerome was, you know, even Augustine, for example, the correspondent of Jerome was appalled by his behavior and how supple he was like, I'm really into origin, now I hate origin, um, you know, changing his mind, behaving appallingly, attacking Ambrose because he was clearly jealous of Ambrose and wanted to be a bishop in his own right, wanted ordination. No one would ordain Jer Jerome. He keeps moving around. Jerome was not an impressive character, not an example. Yeah, and yet who's promoting the Marian doctrines? Jerome. Um, Cyril, Cyril is, you know, behaves app appallingly around the council, you know, is, is a politician rather than a bishop, and yet, why do we like him? Oh, because he teaches the right things about Mary. So I think it's like it puzzles me because what I keep seeing is that the people with the who are behaving badly are promoting this doctrine, and yet we forgive them because we like the doctrine. Well, I'd say, well, let's look at the lives. Of course, people can spin huge nets of ideology to make themselves sound right. Let's look at their behavior. And when once we've got evidence of behavior, all the people promoting the new Marian cult are the wrong people. Now, let me ask this um, before we change uh, subjects, which would be, there are like, I'm sure Gambaro talks about it. Um, Father Christian Cops talks about it. They talk about a low Antiochian Mariology. Essentially, the assertion being that those the more literal interpretation of scripture, which they stereotype to be Antioch, didn't have this highfalutin Mariology, which would be consistent with the stereotype that they have this kind of literalist approach to the scriptures. Um, my question would be if I want to give you both an opportunity, if you'd like to, to maybe discuss certain statements from St. Cyril or oh, who's not Antiochian, but St. John Chrysostom particularly, um, that may bear on this, because this is what usually comes up, um, at least the stereotype, forgive me, Protestant context when they talk about patristic teachings on Mary, right? Because we agree there's really nothing too explicit other than Tertullian before Nicaea. So it's really after Nicaea where you start seeing explicit statements about Mary and things bearing on these issues now that way that loom so large. Mm -hmm. So let me give you guys an opportunity to maybe comment on that intelligently so people could hear the Protestant side instead of my side or the Roman Catholic side. So, Father James, you first. Uh, I would rather we start with the uh, patristic scholar here. Um, but, yeah, no, I'm trying to think of specific ones about uh, from St. John Chrysostom. Uh, do you have any examples? Like, well, for example, the wedding at Cana, and Jesus yeah. uh, corrects his mother, or when the um, his brothers uh, and Mary come, and, uh, you know, the part of the gospel that says he was out of his mind. And they come, and uh, St. John Christum mentions that uh, they had vainglory. So, like, passages like that that get quoted a lot. And if yeah. you don't remember, you could, you could say, hey, yeah, David. I'm gonna have to, yeah, I'm going to have to go with David with this one. All right, David, it's all up to you. <laughs> we might have lost David. David, are you there? You're on mute still. Well, you know, I think, I think that the Theotokos... Right, I don't want to push this too far because people use it against me. Uh, but I think the Theotokos may be like, "Hey, wait, she's upside oh, down." Oh, upside down, no. <laughs> you know, she, the Theotokos doesn't want anyone misrepresenting Saint John Chrysostom. I'm joking. I'm going to table that. When David comes back, he could definitely respond to it. 
Um, now, Father, you are obviously part of a Western Christian tradition. You're barely Protestant, according to your own name. And so my question for you would be, um, David's back, so uh, now I feel bad. So I'm going to give this the question, and we'll give that back then to David afterwards. Immaculate Conception seems to me something that kind of splinters the Western tradition. And so my question for you is, why is it so bad in the end? Because, right, Jesus Christ still saves people. It's just another honor for Mary to throw on top of the others, which you already don't agree with. So why is this not a big deal? Why is this a big deal to you in a bad way? Actually, this is uh, the, the Immaculate Conception is the only one I, I think that I can that I don't agree with. I mean, I agree that she's queen of heaven. I agree that uh, bodily assumption, uh, ever virginity. Um, so I would say that the Immaculate Conception, there are problems with it. I I would say that uh, I am more okay with it if it's understood that she was set free from original sin, uh, which seems to be the more Thomistic understand, like St. Thomas Aquinas himself. Uh, but the modern Roman position is that she was kept from original sin. And so she was never touched by original sin. So I would find a problem with that. Uh, part of it is, I it just, I, I would say it goes explicitly against scripture. Um, and so the, the Phil and people aren't aware, like in, among the scholastics, there's debate and because the, they didn't know there was debate over when even conception occurred and when, you, the, when yeah. Solomon occurred. Mm -hmm. So the argument was she was conceived whether immediately afterwards or during quickening at that yeah. point, then she was essentially baptized. Her original sin yeah. was taken care of. And so you're saying you'd be open to that just do, cause you find that within the earlier Western tradition. Well, in part, but I also find it just more theologically uh, uh, tenable, I would say. Okay. Uh, rather than kept from original sin at like for all time of her entire existence. Um, so I would say that, uh, one of the things that I did learn as a Baptist that I actually do really, really want to keep, and I think is actually, I, I don't know if there's any uh, evidence for this patristic wise, but uh, it, it actually fits nicely, I would say theologically, is that the reason the virgin birth was necessary was that sin was passed on through the, the, the seed of the man. And so uh, Christ has to be born of a virgin because uh, by that he does not receive the sin nature because he's he's because the seed the sin nature is not passed on through the seed of uh, through the seed because he's not conceived by the seed of man. Um, so, with that, I think it explains very well the reason the necessity for the virgin birth, and on top of that, I think it also helps with the question of how can Christ be conceived uh, from human flesh without being tainted by the uh, sin nature, obviously coming from an uh, original sin mindset. All right. And, and David, um, if you want to, I'll give you an opportunity to comment on the Immaculate Conception now, if you like, and then we'll rewind a little okay. bit because he disappeared. We'll talk about maybe. Well, uh, sorry, just need this toilet. I had too much to drink. Um, so um, basically, yeah, immaculate except James has just given a sort of rationale for why it makes sense. I talked about the exercise of Christian imagination, the exercise of Christian rationality, intellect. It, may, it means us exploring the whys and wherefores, but the whys and wherefores are not part of the apostolic deposit. I think we can all agree on that. How we explain why the virgin birth had to happen is quite different from the fact of its happening. The New Testament does not tell us why, it just tells us this happened. This is history. The Bible's function is simply to teach us history. Um, and with the world we're in, you know, and um, so I think the imagine, immaculate conception and everything connected with it is just fantasy football. I mean, it's completely bonkers. It's uh, got absolutely no relation. And in that way, it's formally similar to Gnosticism. If you look at Irenaeus's account of the Valentinian system, it's remarkably similar to a lot of 19th century Catholic Mariology, at least um, in the sense of this endless sort of elaboration of, of rational webs of doctrine and ideology that just got absolutely no grounding in scripture and absolutely no grounding in the first 300 years of patristics and only hints in the first 400 years of patristics. Um, you have to go a long way up the patristic line in order to get anything like it. So no, I think actually conception is complete fantasy. It's just got nothing to do with scripture at all. Um, and it, it, for me, it was an ideological move. It was 
the Roman Catholic Church is its interest in Mary, and that what I would call the dark century, 1850 to 1950, it was Mary was an expression of the interior self-consciousness of the institution. So the, the sort of deification of Mary was part of the sectation was sort of uh, become narcissistic and self-worshipping and Mary was part of that self-worship. But I, what I love and celebrate about Vatican II is that the, uh, the Rana brothers and the um, and Benedict and uh, Carol Bolcher, who became John Paul II, the, the whole team who led Vatican II and, and the voting behind the council consistently relegated the Marian stuff, um, brought it back down to earth. The, it was a close vote on several points, but basically all the Marianists, and there was a huge Marian movement worldwide in Catholicism running up to 1950, not running up just before the, the council was called. Um, the Marianists were strongly saying, we have to have a document all about Mary and how Mary's very special, blah, 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 blah. And not very bothered about Christ, it's gotta be about Mary. And the council, again and again in its votes, as well as in its theological leadership, said, no, Mary belongs inside Christology, Mary belongs inside ecclesiology, and that's where they put her. So Lumen Gentium, the big document of the, on the church that's central to Vatican II, there's four central documents, but that's the most central of the central documents, and um, Lumen Gentium has a chapter on Mary, so she's put inside ecclesiology, which is the, the right thing to do. Um, so the Catholic Church, in its doctrine, massively pulled back on that dark century of Marian fantasy, I think. But no, I, I have no time for immaculate conception. I just think, because for me, it's just factually, it's just got nothing to do with previous Christian tradition. It's everything. To, I, I would read it as a sort of abstracted ideological expression of a very sick institution. That's how I understand immaculate conception. Assumption, um, I admit with James that assumption is better attested in the previous thousand years, but again, it's not there in the Fathers, it's not in Scripture. Anything, any, basically, as soon as the church starts trying to talk about Mary along these lines, at her birth, at her death, so what? What is that got to do with the apostles? The apostles do not teach this. The fathers do not teach this. If we are talking about it, if we are arguing about it, and especially if the church is divided by it, then it's not from. The, it has not come from God. That's what I would say. I would take the strong Protestant view. Hey, David, I, I would like to ask you a question, if that's all right. Um, if that's all right, Craig, as well. Correct. All right. So um, what is your view when it comes to theology? Do you hold yourself more to this understanding that you should only derive theology from Scripture itself? Or would it be the more, uh, I guess you could say, traditional Anglican view that uh, when it comes to matters of, of salvation, it should definitely only come from Scripture, um, but, that, um, but otherwise it, it's fine? Well, I think I, I take the Anglican view that's common to most Orthodox and Catholics, which is that we can't pretend to read Scripture independently of the development of the Church, that the, the canon was was a product of the patristic period. You know, I've just spent years, like the last 10 years, just intensively studying the composition of the canon, the New Testament and the early fathers. Um, I'm convinced now the New Testament was assembled by the time of Irenaeus, that it didn't take that long. Um, and that it was mostly the school of John that was involved in the setting up of the canon. I'm convinced of that. That the, if the reason why Irenaeus is the first father to witness to almost every New Testament book is because he's coming from, as he says, the school of Polycarp, the school of John. Um, so I think John was one of the reasons the Lord allowed John to live the longest was to edit the canon, to create the canon. So I take a very early canon view, but I don't pretend that the, that the problem in the States is that a lot of um, Protestantism in the States, this sort of scripture thing is also complete nonsense and also far into scripture. The scriptures don't point to themselves, they point beyond themselves. So, and the scriptures say, you know, Christ is endlessly saying inside the canon, that the church is a, a tree, is a shrub, is a, is a vine, you know, that we're planting something which is meant to develop. And so this is something I think the Catholics have taught me that I've learned from Catholic theology is that a richer, much, much richer ecclesiology, um, that it, there's nothing wrong with the church developing. And so it's made me more open minded about developments. I, I've talked about the Christian imagination with Ephraim the Syrian, for example. I see a lot of that in Catholic Mariology and Orthodox Mariology, the little I've seen is that that is legitimate organ. It's part of our worship is to dedicate our imagination to the Lord, explore things with our imagination. 
But we've got to keep a clear dividing line of what we're up to here. Are we teaching doctrine? It seems to me with the Immaculate Conception, with the doctrine of the Assumption, the Catholic Church went horribly wrong, badly, badly wrong, in that it was it was turning something that was created by the imagination, even uh, the shared imagination over centuries, is suddenly turned into hard dogma, it's turned into law. It's like if you suddenly said, uh, we all have to believe in the Lord of the Rings and the Kingdom of Gondor, and if you don't, you're going to jail or you're not a believer, you know. It's just, it's, it's hardening something. And I understand that that's what some of the best Orthodox responses were along those lines. They were saying, this is a precious part of the imaginative life and prayer of the church. It's not something that we tie down to a hard doctrine. Um, yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. So I, I'm not your classic fundamentalist evangelical saying, this is all rubbish, it's all Gnostic, it's all pagan. I'm not saying that. And I'm not saying that um, Mary, the, 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 the Mariology is illegitimate. The exercise of our reason within the bounds of our faith is legitimate. The exercise of our imagination is legitimate. But let's not pretend it's dogma and let's not pretend it's tradition. Um, but I hope you see what I'm now, David, let me give you an opportunity before we take any audience questions, if they ask them, which would be, um, how would you understand some of the passages from St. John Chrysostom and other fathers, which have more of, as they say, a low Mariology, you know, from Antioch and whatnot? Um, do you want to give any kind of the audience your interpretation of those passages? No, because I only know them in outline. I don't think Chris Ostom is a huge corpus and I don't know it well. I just haven't got to him yet because I'm doing the Fathers in order. So, um, no, I can't comment on Chris Ostom. I would say that I, the one concession that I and many on Patricius for instance, are willing to make to the development of Marian doctrine, I mean, may, as I've said, we mainly deny any development to Marian doctrine, but um, I would say that Irenaeus's idea of the... Um, the of, of Mary as the second Eve um, is a legitimate development from Paul's idea of Christ as the second Adam. It's a fair development and it has a pastoral meaning for women. So I think um, that that piece in it, but you see Irenaeus is deeply tied into the apostolic tradition. You know, he's, he's, he's heard Polycarp preaching, he's heard John preaching. You know, Irenaeus is, is, is deeply rooted, knows his stuff. He's not innocent of, he does stray. I mean, Irenaeus says some very odd things. So he hasn't got a very strong historical sense, but he is deeply tied into the apostolic tradition. Um, so there, there is, it is possible. And when Chrysostom, I, I do know that Chrysostom and a couple of the second, the fourth century guys, I know Chrysostom slightly tips into the fifth century. They. They, um, they do elaborate on the New Eve idea, but they're basically just expanding the same idea. They're not saying something new. Um, they're inferring. They do give us permission by, you know, if they can infer from Scripture, so can we. And this is what Father James was getting at. It's, it's okay to make these inferences. It's okay to try to come up with a theory of why the virgin birth, for example, had to happen. Um, but, but, you know, it's just, it's just a legitimate playing around with our ideas. We mustn't confuse it with doctrine. Um, yeah, I, I want to add to that. I think one of the problems. Uh, sorry, David, do you mind? You, 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 yeah. Uh, I think one of the problems that we see. Uh, I, I get bombarded by Roman Catholics constantly on my page, and it gets uh, the. Some of them are really. Many of them are really, really good and re very respectful. Some of them tend to be really aggressive. One of the things that constantly happens is uh, it's copy pasted from like Catholic Answers or something like that. It will be about two dozen, you know, quotes, uh, you know, one, two sentence quotes, uh, something about St. Peter and the Sea of Peter or the Apostolic Sea. And they're like, look, this proves the papacy. And I think there's a major, major problem with quote mining of the early church fathers. We have to make sure that when we're looking at these quotes, whatever we're trying to defend or argue against, that we're looking at it within the context of actually uh, what the, the author is saying, what he is saying uh, within the theological issues and debates that are going on at the time. Um, we have to keep those things in mind. Just throwing out these quote minds uh, just is not helpful and is not a good way to do patristic uh, scholarship in the least.
Absolutely. And one of the emphases of our discussion, I hope, has been that we've all talked about the over. Well, something I've, I've kept emphasizing is let's look at the whole corpus. Let's look at the proportion of the corpus that's being quoted. Let's look at what is this father's true agenda? What is central to what they're trying to say? Absolutely. The quote mining is ridiculous and both sides do it. All right. And uh, it's on that note, that's one of the big things in this channel, which is why I have some of the worst videos ever when I just like start a book and start commenting on it and <laughs> until it's over um, is because we can't understand uh, a lot of these things. Um, for a second, look like Dave was putting his Darth Vader hood on. Um, <laughs> we cannot understand a lot of these things without having a fuller view of what the fathers teach. Because like one of the things that uh, – I find in the quote in the in the Roman Catholic quote minds, and I've had quoted against me. Um, and I'm just trying to find the uh, the quote here, and uh, which is this: They'll say Augustine taught the Immaculate Conception, and then they'll, they're going to read the quote for you. And the quote, the translation I have is from the Roman Catholic quote mind, and it's from the book against Julianus. And when you actually read against Julianus, you realize this is like the worst possible quote you'd ever want to cite. It's actually literally contradicting their view. And, and so the quote is this, um, and it's paragraph 122 in book four. And the part that's frustrating is that the English only translation was made in the 1950s. The translator really made a condensed version and he oh. chopped out whole other parts and he made new paragraph numbers. So anything from the English translation has nothing to do with the actual Latin, as in if you're going to try to line up paragraphs. You yeah. just have to know if you're really going to look at it. So anyway, here's the passage. Um, Augustine said, We do not deliver Mary to the devil by the condition of her birth, but for this reason, because this very condition is resolved by the grace of rebirth. Right? So Roman Catholics will quote that to show that, oh, she's not delivered um, to being under the devil. And if you read against Julianus, that is the condition of everyone who's not baptized. Now, interestingly enough, you could actually kind of infer that just from that one sentence where it says, because this very condition is resolved by the grace of rebirth, meaning, right, she's not, she's not under the uh, – deliver, Mary's not delivered the devil because it's resolved by rebirth. But if you read against Julianus um, – we find that Augustine explicitly teaches that Mary is born a concupiscence. Um, he teaches that uh, Mary was uh, uh, was baptized at the Annunciation. And if I'm getting the wrong book, I know that's definitely against Maximinius book two. So it's he views like Leo the Great that this rebirth occurred at the Annunciation. So quoting this actually proves the Immaculate Conception doesn't exist. The Immaculate happened. 13 years later. <clears throat> but it's, again, just that one sentence, Roman Catholics love quoting it, and then they just think they've proved everything, and it shows not understanding the book, the argument in the book, and Augustine's corpus. So I just want to add that. Well, so this, to add yeah. that. Vatican II represented a huge revolution in Catholic methodology. Um, they'd had a thousand years of basically everything serves the Catholic Church as an institution. So the Bible, we the Bible only works if it says what we what the papacy is now saying. The fathers only speak if they say what the papacy is now saying. And a lot of the problem for the Catholic Church is that with the enormous momentum um, and the enormous change of direction, it was like a ninety degree turn on a motorway. Um, Vatican II it was such a huge shift. And the problem is that if you read the popes. Um, writings, you know, the, the papal writings since Vatican II, they're excellent. They're really on message. I was nearly converted by studying papal documents. Um, but when I started looking at the Catholic Church in practice, it's nowhere near there. They haven't, they've hardly begun to educate their own laity. And as you see in Catholic online forums, you know, very few Catholics know anything outside of what they've been told to know and they're they're sucked into an institution which is the weakness of you know the strength of catholicism acknowledging the centrality of the institution of the church that the church is primary the problem is only their church is primary and that's a very orthodox point is it not to say you know the catholic church is right about ecclesiology they're just wrong to restrict it to themselves so um yeah i i would just say that in terms of interacting with Catholics, a lot of Catholics, the Catholic Church has just not 
you know, if you talk to those who sit in the seat of St. Peter, they're a whole lot better than everyone under them. And getting lay Catholics to listen, I mean, you know what, in America at the moment, it's very difficult to get a lot of American Catholics to listen to their own Pope, you know. <laughs> and uh, you've interacted with Eric Ibarra, haven't you, Craig? I mean, I found with Eric had a forum called um, Papal Primacy from Origins to the Present. And I used to say to him, this is papal primary except the origins of the present because he, he could he wasn't interested in arguments in the first century at all and i couldn't get into it and he he basically rejected the current papacy i'm not sure if he's not quite a set of accountants but he's um he's on the way so um yeah i i just um, i think the catholic church is on a on a long curve and a long change and a lot depends on whether they can keep following through they spent 50 years following through consistently since vatican ii they're doing well, but it's had very little effect on the um, laity. I, I don't want to either the clergy. I don't want to be on a, uh, a Roman bashing thing, but I I think one of the problems that I do have with Rome is that everything they do is extreme. So they go from extreme uh, Vatican One ism, I guess you could say, to Vatican Two is just another extreme in the other way. So it like you see a very liberalizing trend with. Uh, Rome today. Uh, I mean, we see that in Pope Francis. Uh, I, I, I prefer balance. I prefer... <laughs> I, knew, I knew a personal friend. I was a friend of a friend of Francis when he was first Pope. And uh, so I used to hear what he was saying in the office, you know, and um, I disagree. I think Francis embodies Vatican II extremely well. Um, oh, he does. He does. Yeah. And it, the Vatican II, I don't deny there was confusion, and Vatican II did invent Catholic liberalism. There was no such thing as liberal Catholic theology until Vatican II, really. So, yeah, it, I agree that, that things, um, a lot of, a lot of, some bad things came from Vatican II, but fundamentally, in terms of its relationship, my agenda is that of John 17, you know, the unification of the church. And for me, Vatican II was a huge step forward because instead of being like this massive juggernaut running away from the the rest of Christianity, um, Rome changed and it is now got, it's got a potential face towards the Orthodox world, which is constantly being explored, um, and it's got a potential face towards um, the Protestant world. And the, I don't know which can be resolved first, but I tend to think strategically that the Catholic Orthodox divide is the more important. Um, if that can be healed, then you know the Protestants that won't come for, along for the ride will sort them. You know. <laughs> I. Um... I my, my priority is union with the East more that, so than union with Rome. Um, that, that's what I work towards. Although, uh, well, I guess more immediately would be union with other Protestant sects, uh, especially Lutheranism. I have a lot of love and respect for Lutheranism. So as an Anglican, uh, I think that that should be a... a yeah, well, right. I agree. Running patristics for Protestants, I have been very impressed by what I've discovered about Lutheranism. Um, and the Lutherans that I've met have really impressed me. We've got some great Lutherans. We haven't yet got a Lutheran on the admin team, but I've been working towards it for a while. Um, because they are, you know, I do find a lot of Protestants I deal with, they they come from very shallow, I'm almost all American members. And so I'm a Brit dealing with Americans. I'm dealing with the cross-cultural issue as well as the inter-church issue of pro different kinds of Protestantism. But I find that... Um, a typical thing we have um, is that we have someone brought up in a very shallow Protestant evangelical background where no one reads anything and the Protest and basically the pastor is like a, a miniature pope. And um, they go from that very shallow thing. They think, oh, books, history, you know, the, the history of the church. Christian, and then they suddenly make some huge leap, often into orthodoxy, sometimes into Rome. Um, and they're in a the right muddle because they've gone from, you know, sort of w uh, walking through a puddle, they've dived into the deep end, and they don't understand that the Protestant world is broad and that you can get deeper within the Protestant world. Um, and basically that means older. So yeah, Lutheran and Anglican are much better options, I think. Even some forms of the Baptist church are a lot deeper than others. So <laughs> yeah, and I, I disagree. I, 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 have to, we're going to have to wrap up, but it's a lot of the doctrines that people think are in Protestant, let's say prayers for the dead. The Anglicans have them, Methodists have them, Lutherans have them. Um, you know, so it's, there's, there's differences. And I'd say probably why we did this show, I would say there is no um, Protestant communion with a high Mariology in which I, what I mean specifically would be 
the veneration and asking for intercessions, you know, to actually give hyperdulia to Mary. That'd be specific to Orthodox and Roman Catholics. Um, well, there are, but, there are high Anglicans. The Anglo-Catholics in my country um, will do the full Mary. In fact, they try to outbid the Catholics in being more Catholic than the Catholics sometimes. And they would still say that they're Protestant. Um, it's an oddity that Ang Anglicanism is a very strange beast because it's incredible. It's so broad. It's pre 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 pretty much anything goes. Mm. Now, guys, in the audience, this is your last opportunity to ask questions. I'm going to bring up a, a couple comments. Um, we got good old Alpha Omega who said, LOL, you think Mary needed baptism. LOL. Wow. Well, I'm going to wow Alpha and Omega. And we're going to show you um, an infallible statement from a pope. <laughs> It explicitly says that. Um, be mad, they're both from the same source. First, we're going to read one quickly from Augustine. Um, I have the quote here on my website, so you can look at originally in the Latin, um, but here's a translation where St. Augustine says in his uh, a commentary in the book of Genesis, accordingly, the body of Christ was truly assumed from the woman's flesh, which is from the flesh of sin propagated from her conception. Nevertheless, because his body does not follow her conception in this same way, he is not her flesh of sin, but the likeness of the flesh of sin. Okay, so we have an explicit statement here, this is St. Augustine, um, that Mary was conceived in original sin, which, uh, which is why it makes it sort of strange that uh, people would ever argue Augustine doesn't take that view. But particularly the issue of baptism, because that's the issue Alpha and Omega took issue with, I'm just going to share a screen real quick, and we're going to have two saints, first Leo the Great, talking about the, the Theotokos being baptized. Now, Sermon 24 is one of St. Leo the Great's um, nativity sermons. I've read all of them that are in English translation, um, and so I've read this in context, and he says in the other sermon similar things, but this is, of course, the money quote where he says, for the earth of human flesh, which is which in the first transgressor was cursed, in this the offspring of the Blessed Virgin only produced a seed that was blessed and free from the fault of its stock. And each one is a partaker of this spiritual origin in regeneration to everyone when he is reborn. The water of baptism is like the virgin's womb. For the same Holy Spirit fills the font who filled the virgin, that the sin which the sacred conception overthrew may be taken away by this mystical washing. So we have a explicit statement that the Annunciation was what overthrew her sin. Um, we have St. Ephraim the Syrian in his 16th uh, Nativity hymn. He's, Mary sings, because like in the hymn, sometimes the characters sing, Shall I call you Lord, O you who brought forth his mother in another birth out of the water? Handmaiden and daughter of blood and water am I, whom you redeemed and baptized. Son of the Most High, who came and dwelt in me in another birth, he bore me also in his second birth. I put on the glory of him. All right, so. That's a beautiful one. I love that one. It, it, all of his hymns. I mean, anything. Yeah. From, reading from Ephraim yeah. is like reading the scriptures. Because he's yeah. so into it. It just pours out of him. I'm um, a big fan. But I'll just say. Clearly, this is why people have to read the fathers cover to cover. You can't read the quote minds. You're not going to get them. You're not going to have um, a respectable belief system like orthodoxy, let's say. That's, that, you know, centuries old, and they're going to have this view, and it's not going to mean anything, right? You'd actually go, where are they coming from from this? So in the same way with Roman Catholicism, read their scholars, read Catholic Encyclopedia. They're very – they admit that this thing is a doctrinal development. You know, because you're not going to find this view. It's explicitly contradicted, according to Catholic Encyclopedia, by early fathers. So this is not any of us being blasphemers from your own, you know, I'm thinking of speaking of Roman Catholics, by your own standards. So all right, I'll stop belaboring that point because um, some guys need to go. But guys, if you have any follow-up comments, I'll see if there's any other questions. Um, my, my comment is, uh, just sort of conclusion is that, uh, I think that Mary should not be someone whom evangelicals are afraid of. And that's the people I generally talk to evangelicals. So, uh, the blessed Virgin, the mother of God, the Theotokos is someone whom we should love. And she is, uh, our mother. Uh, I mean, we are, we are, um, heirs of Christ. So. We have this comment from Theodore. 
Um, he says, Catholic apologists use St. Maximus to defend the filial Okay, Maximus says it isn't heretical because the Latins don't make the Son a cause of the Spirit, but the present catechism says he is a cause. So th this is another issue, like, for example, uh, in filial okay debates, and this is where you and I, because you guys are and more Orthodox, would have disagreement. Um, but long story short would be you could find a father that uses the term and the son or through the son, but what's relevant is actually when they're, when they explain what they mean by it. And so what Theodore was referencing was the letter to Marinus. I, uh, I do want to add though, that uh, Anglicanism, at least in the U S has been moving away from the filioque. We are, our uh, standards now actually admit that the original version is the more accurate one. And okay. said, we say that the original is the and that it, that is an option for us to do. So it's better. It's not perfect. I don't. I do not confess the filial way. I'm just maybe oh, theater is another. Theater is asking whether or not um, we're saying that Mary's better if she's more sinful. Um, I know I'm not saying that. I just want to make that clear before people say <laughs> I'm. I'm saying such a thing, um, and I even think they'd be putting words in the mouths of our guests. Yeah, um, I, I don't know how that came about. Yeah. Well, it's slander. You just, you know, just take it as it goes. Um, it's so. we, have right. another, we have another. Aren't these just the highest quality comments? This would be our last one. Um, <laughs> David says no. <laughs> he says Roman Catholics aren't the ones denying that God's essence is in the Eucharist. Um, this is a good. This is a, actually a good point. I'm happy you brought up because it comes up in the same homilies that Saint Leo the Great, where I, I read about baptism, which is this. Um, and I presume you guys, you could answer. I believe you believe in the real presence. Um, I don't know if you reject transubstantiation or not. I do. I do. Um, but that being said, we believe that the, this is Orthodox, that the bread and wine is Christ's flesh and blood, right? The logos made flesh would have the essence and energies of God. So the Eucharist has both God's essence and energies. I don't know who would deny that. Um, cause that'd be a, absolute positive denial of the incarnation from at least Orthodox theology. So I just, Want to make that clear, Alpha Omega, I'm not going to beat up on you because you don't like me because, no, both the energies and essence are in the Eucharist, full stop, uh, that, from Orthodox theology. Just got to make that clear. We're here for Mary, aren't we? Not for the Eucharist. That's a whole other bag. Well, I, I'll say uh, I, I, love, uh, I, I love Eucharistic theology. I would lean more towards Luther's position, which um, people call consubstantiation, but that's, that's not a Luther never used that term. Lutherans don't really use that term. Um, that I would say that it is both, uh, if we're going to use the you know, questions of substance and accidents, it is both substantially the bread and wine and the body, blood, soul, divinity of Christ. So Christ is fully there, fully present. We are physically eating uh, the body and blood of Christ in reception of communion. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't take any of those views, but I, we're not we're not discussing that, are we? So, <laughs> All right, so David doesn't have to give a point. Guys, let me give you an opportunity to plug anything you want to plug before I plug missionary work in Cambodia. David, anything you want to plug? No, I just say if you're interested in logistics, read the fathers and um, you know, don't don't just go and get it. Please don't get it online. Get some blooming books and read books. That's what I would say to anyone. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, thank you for having me on here. It's uh, it's always a pleasure to talk. Um, yeah, barely Protestant YouTube channel. There's a Facebook page. We share memes. They're always snarky. Um, and uh, but on the YouTube channel, actually, I do try to engage in uh, serious questions uh, because within I, I call the channel barely Protestant, but I think maybe a better term for it or better title would be. Protestant and Catholic, because we see ourselves as both Protestant and Catholic. We don't see that as a contradiction. Yeah, and I, I've increasingly seen Anglicanism as a branch of Orthodoxy. We've got a local um, Orthodox priest that I've got to know, um, and he's been writing book after book talking about the local traditions that I would see as Anglican, the Celtic saints, because I'm in Northern England on the border with Scotland, and uh, you know the, the world of St. Cuthbert and so forth, and um, you know, I see, well, it's a form of orthodoxy, really. But, um, so, um, yeah. Anyway, it's been a pleasure, Craig. Thank you. You've, you've been a very pleasant host. It is. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, and, uh, and I just to plug the thing that's scrolling the bottom of the screen the whole time. 
um, to donate to the churches in Cambodia. Every penny that you donate actually goes to those churches in Cambodia. Um, Cambodia is the world's largest, um, not by number, but actually highest proportion of Buddhists in the world. Um, we sort of referred to that a little bit during the show. So it's a fertile ground for evangelism. Um, and so please, uh, so if this has blessed you, um, bless someone else, bless the people in Cambodia with the gospel. Um, well, other than that, I'm going to say, guys, thank you so much for coming on and giving a defense. Um, you know, and whenever we'll see audio things, if don't be sad if like the first 20 minutes of this video gets chopped out, I'm going to try to make a version that people won't get mad at David because <laughs> it, it all start panning out near the end. But guys, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Um, Craig, can you put this on for six for Protestants in case any of them want to read, watch it? Yes, when I when I finish editing it, I will definitely do that. Stay on, uh, stay on uh, the video. When I when we go off, we can still talk for at least a few moments. I'm going to sign off though by saying this: fight to death for the truth, and the Lord God will fight for you. Sirach four twenty eight. God bless you guys.